To God be the glory in Jesus' mighty name. I love you all so very much and I honor the Father for each and every one of you. And I trust that you all have been having an amazing and a glorious day in the presence of the Most High that you truly are. And for that reason, we are here today because I believe the Father has placed a subject in my heart just to be able to teach um, uh, on this dimension. And we are here to learn together. That's what I always help us to understand. It's not a one-man show, <laughs> the identity. We are all included. That is why the Bible declares, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave. And why? That many would not perish when they believe in his name. So you can see, it's one body, but many parts. So today, I want us to look at the subject of revival. And the reason why I want to speak on this subject is because I remember... Um, there was a man, uh, an apostle, basically. And recently, he was in the uh, United Kingdom. Yeah. Can I honor him? Yeah. His name, Apostle Joshua Selman. You know, such a, an amazing son of God. And I honor, I, know, I honor him in light. So recently, he was here in the United Kingdom. And um, yeah, and uh, I believe he came to lay a foundation. And the foundation that he laid was the foundation of revival upon creation. And I really want to thank God because what he was speaking was absolutely uh, true. That revival begins with repentance and then the outpouring of the spirit in the last dimension. So we thank God for that in itself because this is absolutely needed in the body. But I want us to understand at the same time, because a lot of times when we've heard about the subject of revival, we've heard it concerning, you know, the likes of the people who had been, you know, before us, you know, the revival, Azusa revival that broke out and this little revivals that broke out upon creation and then the outpouring of the spirit. And then there was a move of God. But do you ever wonder why those revivals ever came to an end abruptly? Yeah, I will help you to understand it because this is what we are looking at this very day. And we are looking at it from the dimension of who? From the dimension of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So you have to understand that the revival that you have been praying for, the revival that many patriarchs and the saints have been praying for in times past, it is already here. It has always been here because a lot of people are waiting for just a sudden move of God like the day of Pentecost, not realizing that it is already here. Because we see in the book of Genesis, the Bible declares that what? The Bible declares that God created the heavens and the earth. And what happened? He said it is finished. Jesus, upon going on the cross, what did he say? He said, it is finished. And now he has left you and I in charge. Isn't that the reason he told the apostles to go and wait for him in Jerusalem? And when they waited, they are what? Then they were endued with power to go forth and their miracles began to break out. The teachings began to break out. Signs and wonders began to break out. Good. Now, I want us to understand something absolutely beautiful. The truth of, it, of, of the whole thing is, for a revival, yes, to manifest in creation, there needs to be an awakening. A lot of people might look at what does it mean that there needs to be an awakening. Yeah, there needs to be an awakening. Like I shared, the amazing and wonderful, glorious, and uh, you know, such an honor it is to, uh, to honor the apostle who came and set a foundation of what? Of the revival. And after repentance has taken place, Yes, you're born again. To God be the glory. What's next? There needs to be an awakening. Now, let's look at it from the dimension of Jesus. Now, when Jesus resurrected, right, he told his apostles, he said, go and wait for me in Jerusalem, in the book of Acts and chapter 1, until you are what? Endued with power. But before that awakening, yes, of the power of the Spirit before he came, what happened? We see from the dimension of Jesus, right, where he basically called the apostles and told them to follow him. And what was he doing all the while that this was happening? He was teaching them. Yeah, he was teaching them, purifying them in the word, because we can see that Jesus basically gave the testimony of this purification in what? In the book of Genesis and what? Sorry, in the book of John and chapter 17. And what did Jesus say in John and 17? It says here, 
It says, for them, I have what? Let's read it together. It says in verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me in the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. So you can see that before Jesus could bring the revival unto creation, he had to be sanctified first with the word. So this is what we begin to understand, how he showed it with his apostles. So this is why I want us to speak on three dimensions of the manifestation of revival. Yes, we're going to speak in three dimensions. I know there are many in the Bible, but I'm going to focus on the three important ones. And the first one is the word. So you can see why Jesus, yes, we see it in the dimension of him being tested in the wilderness. What did he say? The Satan, uh, Satan came to tempt him and he was what? He was equipped with the word in order to be able to defeat the tactics of the devil. Do you see? It is written. It is written. It is written. And this helped us to understand that Jesus had been fully prepared with the word before he came onto the scene. Isn't that right? Yes. So, because if he had not prepared in the word, there would have been no way that it is written is in the Bible. Now, you can see the foundation of it because at the age of 12, the Bible tells us that he went into the synagogue and the priests there, they were amazed that whose son is this because of the word that was in him. He is the word. And yet he came. And look at how he basically overcame Satan with the word. And now look at the example he set with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, he set with our Lord, our Lord Jesus set with his apostles. <laughs> I repeat that. So the same example he set with the apostles, the word. So you can begin to understand it, that he set it in the word because the Bible consistently tells us that he was always trying to get them into a private place so that he can teach them the word. So now you can see that as Jesus basically right? He left the, the, what's it called? You know, the baptism, went into the, into the wilderness, then he came out. Now look at after he came out, the Bible declares that his fame spread about. This was even before he went into the synagogue to tell us why he came into creation. His fame had already begun to spread. This was even before he preached his first sermon. His fame has begun to spread. Do you see that dimension? Holy Ghost had begun to spread his name. Now, you can see why I always encourage a lot of people because a lot of people are there. They are trying to garner a whole lot of subscribers. They are trying to garner a whole lot of views. They are trying to go, you know, and they have not yet been sanctified by the word. They have not yet been sanctified by the word. They had not yet been sanctified by the word. But yet, they are looking for a lot of views. A lot of people have built sanctuaries. And they are looking for people, how we can get people into sanctuaries. And we are doing all manner of things. But they are not yet sanctified by the word. Do you see that dimension? Because Jesus was fully equipped before he started. And then eventually the fame of him spread about. And when the fame of him spread about, look at what he did. He went into the synagogue. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and as I, he has anointed me. Can you see that? Then in, it went on to say, today the scripture has what? Has been fulfilled. Do you see the beauty of it? Can you see how? The revival broke out. The revival with Jesus did not break out <laughs> with healings, miracles, signs, and wonders. <laughs> Can I repeat that? The revival of Jesus did not begin with miracle, signs, and wonders. No, 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 no. I believe on this channel, I shared what I call the ministry of Jesus. I believe, you know, I will attach the video on the top right-hand side of the, of the screen in which you have a look and you can watch if you're encouraged to. The ministry of Jesus, it helps you to understand how Jesus moved upon creation. So you can see that revival did not break out with what? With miracles, signs, and wonders. It, break out, it broke out with persecution. So you can see it. It broke out with persecution. The Bible tells us that as Jesus was speaking in the synagogue, they escorted him to the edge of the cliff in Luke and chapter what? And chapter 14. So they escorted him 
towards to the edge of the cliff what did the bible tell us they wanted to do they wanted to throw him off but yet he walked in what in the midst of them he walked in the midst because it was not yet his time so you can see that as soon as he came out persecution and what happened after persecution? The Bible tells us this was now when Jesus began to perform miracles, signs, and wonders. Because if you read verse 31, it says, Then he went into Capernaum, a town in Galilee on the Sabbath, and he taught the people. Do you see how it began? What I said, it begins with the word. So Jesus read his ministry out in Luke chapter 4 and then began with the word. And the Bible says they were amazed at his teaching. And then what happened? There was a manifestation. <laughs> Do you see? Because it was there, he began to what? He began to heal uh, those who were demon possessed. Now you can read from verse 38 how healing now began to break out. Can we see a good example in the book of Acts and chapter 2? Yeah. So Acts chapter 2, what happened? When the day of Pentecost came, Apostle Peter basically rose up. And what did he do? He preached the gospel. And upon preaching the gospel, what happened? Persecution also broke out. <laughs> do you see that? Because it was a place, if you read Acts chapter 2, the, you know, Acts chapter 2 was there. He spoke the word. He told them, these men are not drunk with wine, but as you suppose. But this is what Prophet Joel was speaking about, that in the last days, there will be what? There will be the outpouring of the Spirit upon all flesh. So you can see, as he basically addressed the crowd, Many were convicted. They said, ah, what shall we do? And then eventually they began to, I believe this was what I was explaining, Apostle, Apostle Joshua. What did he do? He said repentance. It began with repentance. But then with the apostles, you can see what happened. It began with persecution as it did with Jesus. Because after he healed in what? So after the preaching, you can see Jesus preached the word. So he came out. He read his ministry. He began, he was preaching. And then what happened? There was a man with the unclean spirit. And then many were brought to him. Look at the same pattern with the apostles. They were preaching. And then eventually at three o'clock, they were going into what? They were going into the dimension of what? They were going to the temple. They healed the man who was lame at the feet. And upon that, what happened? The Bible declares that as the man got up, his feet was made whole. Can you see? They began preaching again. And that preaching led to persecution. Didn't that happen with Jesus? <laughs> it did. So you can see why I continue to help us to emphasize that sometimes revival is being taught in the wrong way. Do you see that? Revival is being taught the wrong way. Jesus was basically bringing revival upon creation by himself. But though he was literally with the apostles, he was getting them to taste and see, go into the village, heal the sick, tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cast out demons. So they were tasting and seeing. And why were they tasting and seeing? Because the fullness of the spirit had not yet come upon them. Do you see that? So they could not walk in fullness because Jesus had not yet gone on the cross. Can you see that? So now that Jesus has gone on the cross and the day of Pentecost has come, they, we, I want to help you to understand that revival is already, is where? It is already here. So a lot of people were waiting for the big manifestation. Yes, and this is what the saints of old have been praying consistently for each and every one of us. Yes, the revival the revival because we've been waiting for the revival and the lord is saying you are the revival and the reason why you are the revival is because to whom much is given much is what much is expected so what does that mean the father is saying for where you are i need you to start yeah so you're preaching the word i'm asking you to go out are you healing the sick so you're going out some people are afraid to step out because of persecution some people are afraid to step out because they don't want to be persecuted for the word some people don't want to even speak what the word lord is speaking because they're afraid oh if i if i speak this word people are going to come against me if i speak this word they might say i am a witch if i speak this word you know i might lose viewers if i speak this word i might lose subscribers if i lose if i share this word and you're concerned about all of those things and not moving in the little that he has given unto you. So you can see, the Bible declares, it says, to whom much is given, much is expected. 
The king gave five talents, two talents, and one talent. What happened? He said one talent went and buried. The two talents went and got two more. The five went and got what? Went and got five more. And the father is asking you, what I have given you so far, what have you done with it? Are you using it to amass viewers? Are you using it to amass congregation in your sanctuary? But are you using it in preparation of what I am about to do through you? Do you see that? Because the saints have prayed. Now, I want you to understand that the saints prayed according to the word of God. And you can see that through their prayer, the Father has honored, tasting and seeing what that revival will be like. But truly, I want to tell you that heaven is actually waiting for manifestation of sons. Romans chapter 8 tell us that creation is groaning. It's not groaning for Christians. It's not groaning. Yes, for Christians. No, it's not groaning for servants of God. No, 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 no. It's not groaning for believers. No, not at all. No, it's not groaning for those. It's groaning for the sons, for the manifestation of the sons of God. So for revival to be able to manifest fully upon creation, he's waiting for the manifestation of sons. The Bible tells us, it says in Colossians 1.19, for it pleases the Father, yes, that the fullness of him, can you see that, may dwell in you. The fullness of the Father may dwell in you. The fullness of the Father. The fullness of the Father cannot dwell in Christians. The fullness of the Father cannot dwell in believers. The fullness of the Father cannot dwell in what? In servants of God. And do you know why it cannot dwell there? Because in John chapter 8, it says a slave has no permanent place, but a son belongs to it forever. So three times, this is where I am coming into my next dimension of the word, identity. Do you see that? I'm coming gradually because I said the first one was the word. The second one, second is the identity. So this is where I'm helping you to understand that the fullness is manifested in the son. Because three times in the Bible, Christian was mentioned. Acts 11, 25 to 26, it was rejected. Yes, because it was not, the, it was not Christ who called them Christians. It was the people in Antioch who called them Christians. Because I have given this example before and I will give it again. Just think about it. Now you have, as you've recorded a song, now you take that song to a recording company. It doesn't fit into hip hop. It doesn't fit into reggae. It doesn't fit into R&B. It doesn't fit into contemporary music. What can we call this kind of music? That is what the music industry, they are saying to the song that you sung. They don't know what to call it. So they give it a name. You know what you sang, right? But they didn't know what category to place it in because they need it to fit into a category. Then the Bible tells us that you are not of the world, though you live in the world. So why are you trying to fit yourself into something that the Father has not called you? You're trying to fit yourself to be a Christian, but the Bible tells you that you're not because Jesus upon ascending said, go ye into the world and make me. Jesus wants disciples, not Christians. Jesus wants disciples, not servants of God. Because Jesus has already corrected that notion. He says, I do not call you servant. Because a servant does not know what his master is doing. Isn't it amazing how people don't even know that they are the revival they've been praying for? Because they don't know. They've been praying for something that they already are. But they don't know it because they are servants, slaves. So you can see it. So until we come out of that slavery into the identity that Christ has called us, because he says, I no longer call you servant. I call you friends. So if Jesus has called us friends, what are we still calling ourselves servants? I know Apostle Paul called himself a servant. Apostle Peter might call himself a servant. Thank God for each and every one of them. But I am not a servant. Neither are you. Because you know why? I want you to understand that these people, the same way majority of the people make mistakes, they made a mistake too. Because Jesus called them something, they didn't accept what Jesus called them. They rather called themselves servants. And they believe that they are offering to Jesus humility. No, that is not humility. Because being who God has called you to be is your identity. Not a place of false humility. Ah, God says I'm a son. Well, let me just manage Christianity. Really? Because Christianity is against the word of God. The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, it says, I do not call you. Do you see that? It says for, it is for freedom. No, actually, this is what it says in Galatians 2.20. <laughs> it says that what? 
you have already died in Christ, right? Yes, because you've been crucified in him. It is you who no longer live, but Christ who now lives in you. And the life that you now live, you live in Christ Jesus, the son of God. So you can see Christ is your spirit. So right this minute, I am actually talking to Jesus Christ. Because you know why? In Acts chapter 1, verse 8 or verse 7 thereabout, the Bible tells us in the King James Version, Jesus was given this, what? He was given this command to his apostles. He said, and this is what he rightly said, he said, when you are endued with, with power, you are going to be witnesses to me. Can you see? Are they not doing things for Jesus? Yes, they are. Shouldn't it be the other way around for Jesus? <laughs> Isn't it? Should, shouldn't it be we're witnessing for Jesus? But no, he said, you're going to be witnesses to me. So that means for every person that is in Christ Jesus, they are already Christ. So you are actually witnessing to Christ. So the reason why they don't know they are Christ yet is why Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, Awake, awake, O sleeper, that Christ may shine on you. So the reason why they are not yet known to be what? To be out, to be Christ is because they have not yet woken up to that identity. Isn't that amazing? So you can begin to understand the principle of this word in Galatians 2.20. Doesn't that defy Christianity? Because Christianity says you're Christ-like, right? So how can you be Christ-like when Jesus himself says you're Christ? So if you're basically saying you're a Christian, then there is no need for you to be in the book of John chapter 17. Just take that John chapter 17. Every time you preach the gospel, avoid John chapter 17 completely. Don't even go there. Because for you to understand that you are Christ, this is the prayer that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. It says, Father, make us one as you and I, we are one. It is all about oneness. I am not separate from my Lord and my Savior. I am one with him. I remember there is a TV show I was watching called The AD. AD continues. And it was the story of Jesus Christ. And this was when Apostle Paul came onto the scene. And there was something so profound that they recorded in that show that really stands out to me. And this is what happened. When Apostle Paul was converted, he went back to where Peter was. They were trying to reject him. And Peter was saying, hey, you know, when our Lord was with us, this is what he did. Do you know what Apostle Paul said? When your Lord was with you, he has not gone away from me. He's in me. Right here. <laughs> Do you see that? He's in me. So he's not far away from me. He's in me because I and him, we are one. So you can see why Apostle Paul got the revelation completely in the Bible by teaching about the sonship. So you can see why you are a son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You are that son. So you basically understand you are the son that he has given unto creation. And whosoever believes in you will not perish but have everlasting life. But where are the sons? They've abandoned their post and they've gone into Christianity, slavery. The second dimension, in the book of Acts chapter 22, Apostle Paul was standing before Agrippa. Agrippa said, are you trying to make me a Christian too? Agrippa said, no. I'm sorry, Apostle Paul said, no. I'm trying to make you who I am except for these chains. Do you see that? Who is Apostle Paul? A son. <laughs> Do you see that dimension? In 1 Peter chapter 4, Apostle Peter was telling us, he was saying, hey, if you're suffering as Christ, rejoice. If you're suffering as Christ, be glad. If you're suffering as Christ, know that you are on the good path. <laughs> but then he went on to say, I believe 17 to 19 thereabout. He said, but however, if you're suffering as a Christian, rejoice because you bear that name. So a lot of people are suffering. Not as Christ, but they are suffering because of that identity, Christianity. Isn't that amazing? So this is why he calls us out. So for you to be able to walk in the revival, Jesus said, do you see? He says, a son cannot do anything by himself except that which he sees his father do. So you can see why Jesus was able to manifest miracles, signs and wonders, opening the eyes of the blind, causing the lame to walk. He was basically, the woman with the issue of blood was healed. So look at Jesus basically breaking out revival all by himself all through his ministry. How was he able to do that? Because he knew who he was in the father. When you know who you are, 
Yes, not as a Christian, not as a servant, not as a believer, not as a Christian, then you will be able to walk in it in full manifestation. For it pleases the Father that the fullness of him may dwell. The fullness of him. The fullness of who? The fullness of the Father in him. Who is him? The Son. And who is the Son? It is who you are. So the fullness cannot dwell if you're still a Christian. So that is why Christians, they taste and see that the Lord is good. Do you see that? But they cannot walk in it. And what is the fullness of that walk? The Father is good. Do not call anyone Father. <laughs> you call me good? <laughs> no, the Father is the good one. So you can see, the reason why Jesus can walk, can walk in the fullness of the manifestation of goodness of God was because he was walking in the fullness of his identity as a son. So you can see why majority of us cannot walk in the fullness why we keep going around in cycles. We've been around this mountain long enough. So we are praying for what we have become. And the reason why we are praying for what we have become is because we are still in slavery to see who we truly are. Does that help you to understand that you are the revival? And this is what Jesus was able to, was trying to help us to bring. You can see why the apostles were able to walk in it in fullness from the beginning to the very end. And why the Father is saying, you are able to walk in this from the moment I release you into ministry until you finish when I call you home. Yes, you're able to do it. But the reason why many people are not able to walk in it is because the Lord has given you but you're using it for something else. He says, hey, look after this, but you're doing something else. Some people are so busy with ministry. Some people are so busy with their business. God has given some people, like in John chapter 17, those ones that you gave me, I have not lost anyone. Some people have lost people. Yeah, because they had to walk away from you because you were doing what you were supposed, you were thinking you were supposed to do, not doing what the Father intends for you to do. And that is what? To establish his kingdom. Majority of the people are not establishing his kingdom. They're establishing their own kingdom. So you can see, the father can say, you've come into the season of miracles. I've come into the season of miracles. Majority of the time when people hear, you've come into a season of miracles. What you're doing is you are expecting a miracle for yourself. But Jesus is trying to tell you that you have come into the season of miracles, which means you are here to perform miracles to those around you. So I'm going to bring you the sick. I'm going to bring you the lame. I'm going to bring you those who are blind. I'm going to bring those who are unwell. And you are going to begin to heal them. Can you see? But rather, we're so focused on ourselves. Oh, the Lord is about to give me miracles. He's about to give me miracles. Yeah, he wants to give you a miracle. But you have to what? You have to understand that when he's giving you this opportunity, you're sowing that miraculous seed in the lives of others because what you sow, you will eventually reap. So you see why your identity is important? The word, Jesus began with the word. The second, identity, knowing who you are. For God so loved the world that he gave. Unto us a child is born, but unto us a son is given. That is why Jesus was saying categorically in Matthew chapter 19. He says, hey, yeah, Peter was saying, hey, we've left everything to follow you. He said, well, I know you have. And those who have followed me, they will sit on the 12 thrones of Israel. And they will judge. Yep, yeah, they will judge. And he helped them to understand anyone who has left brothers, fathers, he gave the condition for sitting on the throne. He said, anyone who has left brothers, fathers, wives, mothers, everything for my sake, yep, they will sit on that throne. A lot of people, they're not willing to let go of Christianity. They want to hold on to that slavery. You see, a lot of people, they don't want to let go of that identity of servant. They hold on to that slavery. And the father is saying, all you can do is taste and see. So yeah, all your, your, your basically in your ministry, you're seeing miracles here, yeah, you're seeing God doing, yeah, you're tasting and seeing, and it's because of the people, that is why the Father is honoring it. So you can see, a lot of people, we host these conferences, we go here, we go there, you're tasting and seeing it. Do you see that dimension? So the reason why the people cannot get the fullness of the miracle that they're seeing, or the fullness of the revival that they're expecting, is because... Some, some of these conferences, they are not being built or they are not being done because we are trying to magnify Jesus. We are doing it because we want to what? Magnify our own ministries. Magnify our own businesses. Hey, to tell them my ministry has got all of this. So it has become a competition in the body rather than the revelation of Jesus. All begins with identity. So the, you can see why the revival breaks out and it stops. The revival breaks out and it stops. The revival breaks out and it stops. But with Jesus, it started and it ended. On the, it, you can see, and it's still continuing until today. When I said it ended, it didn't end with Jesus because 
It ended because he had to go to the cross and it began even in a new dimension when he resurrected. Because he said, as he is, so are we. So it ended, yes, because he was walking in the realm of the flesh, but it began in a new way, the new wine, when he started his dimension in the realm of the spirit. Do you see? But in the realm of the, when he was here, the Bible tells us from the very beginning of Luke chapter 4 to the very end, he was still healing. Yes, because when he was betrayed, Marcus, yeah, Marcus, Marcus, the, the soldier who came to arrest him, that Peter basically, yeah, had the ear removed. You can see that all the way to that very moment, he was still healing. <laughs> do, you, do you see him? Because it never finished. No, it didn't. And he got up on the third day and went after his disciples. So you can even see that it continues with you because Jesus said it is finished. So Jesus in, in the book of John chapter 19 was telling you, my assignment here is done. So I'm here to give the man, I'm here to pass on that which I have finished here to pass it on to you because in me, you now continue it. But a lot of us don't follow the pattern as his identity is calling us to. That is the reason why we cannot manifest that fullness. So you can see why we still continue to pray. Because Jesus said, he says what? So if you look at what happened, he wants to bring the new wine. The new wine is already here. Holy Ghost has not left since the day of Pentecost, but he's only looking for the one person that will understand the seasons and the timings and to understand how this truly works so that he can fully manifest. That is what Holy Ghost is waiting for. To un for somebody to get the understanding of what revival truly means. That to for them to know that they are the revival. To pick up that mandate as the Lord has orchestrated them for them to do so. And run with it. Do you see that? So Holy Ghost is the new wine. Holy Ghost is the reason for the revival. He is already here. And because he's already here, a lot of us are still doing what we think we should be doing. We are teaching what we believe we need to be teaching. And we are basically performing what we need to perform and not doing it as the Lord. You know, the very process that Jesus laid out. Jesus gave us a very beautiful blueprint. But we are not following the blueprint. We are following our own blueprint. And the blueprints that other people have basically laid down and they've gone and they left. Thank God for them. We honor the Father for those people who were able to help us to taste and see the what the revival breakout but that in itself was not supposed to end it was supposed to be a continuous process like jesus was three years jesus kept giving them revival after revival because if you read the gospels the bible says every single time they were running to jesus they would bring the sick to jesus every time jesus entered into a town jesus is here gather all the sick around the neighborhood let's go and give them to jesus because we know that he will heal them Oh, Jesus will be passing by. There is a woman, there is a widow who has just lost a son. And Jesus is like, what do we have here? Why can't this person die when I'm alive? Can you see? And then eventually he touched the briars. The son got up. He handed him over back to the mother. And Jairus came. My daughter is sick. And as Jesus was walking by, the fullness of the father was upon him. And what happened? The woman with the issue of blood came, touched the hem of his garment. And he was made, she was made whole. And on the way to Jairus' house, they said, hey, don't bother him anymore. He said, this woman, the the girl, she's dead. Jesus said, look, you, all I need you to do is just believe. And as he got there, those who were mourning, he chased them out. He said, wait, you, you know, little girl, Tabitha, get up, get up. You know, he told her, get up. And she got up and they gave her something to eat. And Lazarus, Lazarus was dead and they called on Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, okay, let's wait a few more days. Jesus allowed him to die just for them to understand that the revival is here. That is why when you see the question that Martha was basically asking, he said, I know that he will be raised on the last day and Jesus was saying Martha the revival is already here the resurrection is already here it is him standing in front of you do you believe this Martha said yes I believe that you will still raise him on the last day Jesus said I am resurrection and I am life you do not need to wait till the last day and what did Jesus do roll the stone away and they rolled it and what did he do he said Lazarus come forth can you see that even before then what was happening they said is it not this one who was Basically opening the eyes of the blind. How would they allow Lazarus to die? Not understanding that Jesus was here to do even something greater than what they expected. People were hungry. And they were like, where are we going to find money? Where are we going to find the money to feed these people? Jesus said, look, this is not about money. <laughs> Revival is here. <laughs> find me bread. Yep, find me bread. Find me fish. Find me something. 
Let's work with it. Five loaves of bread, two fish. Father, I thank you. Multiplied it, gave it to the apostles. The apostles gave it to the people. They ate and there was an overflow. So you can see the Father helping to understand. This was not Jesus doing it to one or two people. The Bible says there were 5,000 men, excluding women and children. So you can begin to understand that this was a revival that was breaking out on a large scale with Jesus. Just one man. The Father wants to do that with a lot of sons. And he's telling you, creation, yes, it tastes, creation is responding by tasting and seeing with Christians and all of those people. But the fullness of the manifestation to basically speak to creation is in the what? Is in the sonship, identity. So until we come into the knowledge of who we are as a son, we are going to keep praying for revival. We are going to keep waiting. So we are going to be transferring that revival. So this, this revival is an inheritance for some people. So because it did not manifest it through you, now you are going to have to transfer that inheritance to another generation. And the father was saying, all I was waiting for you is to sit with me. Let me show you who you truly are so that you can. But we don't basically wait on him to reveal us to us. Because remember, the father, the son, and the spirit. What is the job of Holy Ghost? One of the very job of Holy Ghost is to reveal reveal you. Yes, reveal you. Why is he revealing you? Because you are Christ. So Holy Ghost talks about Jesus and Jesus talks about the Father. Do you see that dimension? And this is where you've come. Holy Ghost is basically trying to reveal you to you as Jesus and then you revealing the Father eventually. Do you see the very pattern of that? But we don't wait for him to reveal us to us. We allow all the people of the old, the saints that have got to reveal us to us. So that is why we do not want to learn something new with the Lord, but rather we are just recycling what religion has taught. The seven mountains, dying to self, all of these things that is absolutely untrue in the Father. And we continue to recycle those things, expecting, so we're doing the same thing, expecting a different result. I'm not saying that is, that is not possible. It is possible. Yeah, the Father can get you to do that if he wants to. It's his will. But he's trying to help you to understand that there is a higher dimension. Your identity is important. You cannot manifest. You cannot manifest the fullness as a Christian. You cannot manifest, and I say you cannot because the Bible tells you a slave has, so the reason why I say you cannot is because a slave has no permanent place. It's not a permanent place, a slave. No, not at all. I hope a lot of us, I want to encourage us to watch, um, you know, has anyone, any one of us seen this movie? And it talks about uh, 12 years of slave. Uh, 12, years of, 12 years of slave, I believe it's a movie. Where this man basically unknowingly, you know, he followed his friends and then following his friends, he was basically led into slavery for many years until somebody came, decided to hear his story. And what happened? Upon hearing his story, they brought him out of that slavery. They fought the battle and they brought him out of that slavery. Can you see? This is exactly what Jesus did for us. That we, they went into slavery just like they did in Egypt into an identity that is not of the Lord, Christianity, all of those things. And now Jesus is here to bring us out of that slavery so that we can be free once again. A child of God is slavery. That's why the Bible tells you in Galatians chapter 4, it says that what? A child who owns everything, that's the heir, is no different from a slave. It's no different. Because the child is kept under tutors and guardians until the appointed time. So people who claim, I am a child of God, how many times have you missed your appointed time to become a son? Because you cannot be a child of God and a son at the same time. That's duality. Look at that five-year-old that is in your neighborhood. Can you call that five-year-old an adult? No, he's a child. So that is exactly what people are doing. I'm a child of God, but yet you're saying you're an adult. How can you be a child and an adult at the same time? That is why the Bible declares, it says, I cannot tell you many things right now. So the things I want to tell you, I cannot tell you them. Why? Because you are still a child. That is why it says in the scripture, it says that what? When I was a child, I spoke as a little child. Can you see? So being a child of God, you are speaking as a little child. But then it says, when I became an adult, yeah, I'm speaking like a grown person. So when you become a son, you now begin to walk in maturity. Appointed time, Galatians chapter 4. And when the appointed time came, he became a son. The appointed time is your maturity, a sonship. 
That is why it goes on to say he has not given you the spirit. Yes, of what? Of slavery, but that of adoption. Yes, that helps you to cry out what? Abba, Father. <laughs> Amen? So you begin to understand. So we've, speak, we've spoken about the first dimension, which is the word. The second is identity. The third is the manifestation. You can see the manifestation of it. Yes, because when Jesus came out of the wilderness, you can see how he was manifested unto the people. You can see when the apostles, after they had stayed in the what? In, the, in Jerusalem, they eventually were manifested to the people. So you have to understand that before manifestation, there is a waiting that happens. And that is the very bit that a lot of us are not willing to do. Now, let's look at it because this has been consistent even from the Old Testament. Joseph was basically hidden, yes, before it was time for him to face Pharaoh. Amen? David was in the wilderness before it was time for him to come before Saul. Do you see the beauty of that? Manifestation, Jesus was with his spirit until it was the appointed time at the age of 30 for him to come and be baptized. Do you see why the father told? Jesus said he breathed on them Holy Ghost. So Jesus had already pre prepared the way by breathing Holy Ghost on them. Then he said, go and wait. So there is a waiting. And how long is the waiting for? The waiting can be for two days. The waiting can be for a week. The waiting can be for a year. The waiting can be for two years. The waiting can be for three years. The waiting can be for 40 days. The waiting can be for however long the Father intends for that waiting to be. And why is the waiting needed? The waiting is needed because it is in the waiting that you are equipped. It is in the waiting that you are knowledgeable about the Word of God. It is in the waiting that preparation begins to manifest. Can you see that in itself? Because David coming before Saul. He was still basically training. He was training. That is why he was what? He was literally fighting these battles and they were saying David kills in 10,000 uh, uh, what's his name? Saul basically killed in a thousand because he was being prepared. Joseph was in prison. He was being prepared. Jesus was being prepared until it was the appointed time. The apostles had to go and wait. So some of you, this is why you have been in a place of transition, waiting. You don't know what's next. You don't know what's going to happen, but you're waiting. You're waiting because why are you waiting? The Father is saying you're waiting because it's a place I am what? Equipping you because you're about to be sent out to go and fulfill the manifestation of what I've promised you. Because for majority of you, it was not about how many people. For majority of you, it was not about how many subscribers. For majority of you, it was not about how many views. But the Father has been using that to prepare you you gradually to prepare you gradually to look after people gradually and in preparation in looking after look at eventually what came to be yes because as soon as you come out look at the manifestation because the bible says when jesus came out his fame so for some of you you're about to come out and you're coming out yes your fame is going to precede even your ministry your fame is going to precede your business your fame is going to precede your marriage your fame is going to precede so many things even before you set up that business your fame has gone about before you set up that ministry your fame has gone about before you set up or write that book or write that your fame has gone about why because you have been in the waiting period you can see in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit came, they came down. They said, ah, even before they came and began to speak, they said, Can't? they were basically speaking in tongues. And they said, wait, you know, they were basically blasting that song in tongues. They were speaking that tongues. They said, ah, can't we hear these people? Look, they, they are speaking in our languages. That one is speaking in Phrygia. Uh, that one is Syphonesia. You know, we're hearing them in our languages. How can this be? And that preceded the word of God to come forth. Amen? So this is the dimension the Father is helping you to understand. That this is what is the Lord is. So the manifestation is helping you to understand that there needs to be an awakening that happens. Yes, awakening. So a lot of people can be saying, ah, we are going, we are going to basically host a conference of awakening. The awakening conference. But the awakening conference is you are awakening back into slavery. You are not awakening into your identity. You are awakening back into slavery. Because the true awakening that the Father has brought upon creation is awakening from your slavery into your identity. And it is done by the Word. And the Word eventually leads to what? It leads to your identity. So the awakening of your identity it eventually leads to the manifestation and the manifestation is him revealing you unto creation that even before 
you say anything. People have heard who you truly are. And this is what the Lord is doing in this hour. And he wants to awaken so that you can walk in the fullness. For it pleases the Father that the fullness of him may dwell in you. For it pleases the Father that the fullness of him may dwell in you. For it pleases the Father that the fullness of him may dwell in you. Revival is the fullness of God. The revival is the fullness of God. And it is manifested in sons, not slaves. Because only slaves, they taste and see. Yep, they taste and see. So you can see. The reason why I said you taste and see, I want us to look at it from this dimension. Let's, we honor wisdom. Wisdom will honor you. Think about somebody in prison and eventually decided to go on a jailbreak. So he escapes from prison, right? And for a time, the escape is only short-lived. So he's a slave in prison, but he breaks out. He breaks out, not legally. He breaks out illegally. So upon him breaking out, what happens? Nay, security will have to be called. Police will have to be called. All of these people will have to be called because he has escaped. So let's bring him back. That is what Christianity is. So you're trying to manifest freedom, but yet in slavery. It's only a matter of time. You're going to lead people back into slavery. Do you see that? So it's only, yeah, it's only a little while. Because what's going to happen? Yeah. So you basically exercise that freedom. Yes, you basically went out there. Maybe you had a few burgers. You had a few chips and pizzas. You basically tasted what freedom felt like. But it's only a matter of time when security catches up with you. Do you see the beauty of it? It's only a matter of time when he catches up with you. So this is why the Father is wanting. So this is why I always encourage a lot of people, be careful, you know, because a lot of leaders, you might want to be there. So that's why I believe I've shared here before that leaders, you need to be careful. Yes, you need to be careful. Yes, of the people that you are literally releasing into ministry. Because if you're not yet working in the fullness of your identity, you are releasing them back into slavery. Do you see that dimension? Amen. I believe I was sharing my story here and I was talking about a kingdom spouse that the Lord was bringing around me and basically releasing that person into ministry. And the Lord said, you should not have done it yet. Why? Because so the Bible says that if you release them into ministry, what happened? You are going to share in their sins. Do you see? I had to repent of that transgression. <laughs> do you see that dimension so now it's basically understand the father I, I, you know because that person is not basically walking in the will of the father so now you can see you know feeling what the person is doing and the lord is like yep and i'm grateful for his mercy because he eventually broke that off so you can begin to understand it and the beauty of what the father is doing and the father is saying hey you know you're releasing slaves in, you're releasing people who are in slavery you're releasing them even to go and gather more slaves whereas i'm looking for people who are manifesting their identity as sons so that they can bring them into, into freedom because it is for freedom that christ has set you free not to be yoked again into slavery and i want to emphasize does it mean that Christians and believers and all those people, they are not going to make it into heaven? They are going to make it into heaven. But they just don't have a throne to sit on. They have a throne, but they can't sit on it because they were slaves before they left creation. No, they can't sit on it because Jesus has given the condition for sitting on it. And the Bible tells us that his word will not return to him void. He says that anyone who has left houses, brothers, fathers, mothers for my sake, not for the sake of Jesus alone, but for the sake of his identity as son. So if you look at child of God, it talks about slavery. Christian is not, is not an identity in the father. A believer is not identity in the father. Can you see a servant is not an identity in the father. A son belongs to it forever. So you can see why there are only 144,000 people sitting on the throne. How many Christians have gone and died? How many Christians have died? There are millions of them. They became born again and they died. But only 144,000 sat on the throne. So not everybody is going to sit on that throne. <laughs> Do you see that? Otherwise, the, the millions of them will have a throne. The Bible will have recorded. That is why it says that in front of the throne, there were multitudes from other nations. So it tells you where other people are going to be in front of the throne. They can't sit in the throne because they're still slaves. They went up as slaves. Though they're in Christ, but they went up as slaves. And a slave has no permanent place. 
So this is why the Father is helping you to understand revival breaks out in these three dimensions. The Word, there is a preparation. He sanctifies you by the Word. Secondly, what happens? Your identity is very, very important because for your for the revival to last, because some of you, you are going to go forth, you are going to raise the dead. Because when Jesus got up, the Bible says that what? When he died, many who died, yes, they rose up. But then the Bible tells us that they did not come out until Jesus stepped out of the grave. So you can see in resurrection what happened. They all came out when Jesus basically came out of the grave. They all came out and they said they began to walk on the streets. Many people began to see them. So majority of you, you are going to raise people from the dead. Majority of you, you are going to open the eyes of the blind. Majority of you, you are going to allow the lame. Yes, by the miracles that you're performing. You're, the lame will walk. The, those who are basically not able to conceive, they will bring forth children. Many signs and wonders will break out upon creation because of your identity. So for you, starting the business, starting the ministry, is helping you to understand from the beginning of your ministry all the way to the very end of your ministry, it's going to be revival all the way through, exactly as it was with Jesus. And the reason why it is going to happen, it is because you have what? You have understood your identity and you're manifesting. So this is why we have been teaching. Learn to speak to the trees. Learn to speak to the birds. Learn to speak to dogs. Learn to speak to cats. Learn to bless them. Understand because because God has a lamb on the throne with seven spirits. So if you have a pet in the house, yeah, that pet, the spirit of the Lord is upon that dog. The spirit of the Lord is upon that cat. The spirit of the Lord is upon that alligator. The spirit of the Lord is upon that lion. The spirit of the Lord is upon that giraffe. The spirit of the Lord is upon that hawk. The spirit of the Lord is upon that eagle. You can see the beauty of it because it says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What is on the dog, the fish and all of those? Flesh too, right? So that is why the Father has been taking you through the process. Speak to the trees. Pray for the plains. Pray for all of this. Pray for the birds. Because it's all part of creation. You're not here just to minister to people. You're not here to wake those people up from the dead. You're, you can wake animals too. Oh, my bird just died. Your bird just died? All right. Father, I raise this bird up back to life. And the bird gets up and begins to fly about. Do you see the beauty of it? <laughs> Amen. To God be the glory. So I want to leave this with you in Jesus' mighty name for us to understand that the revival is already here. You are the revival. And every step that you take, yes, for what he has given you is helping you to understand the manifestation of the revival in you that is already breaking out. So, as you follow him, gradually, surely, doing what he has called you to do, eventually, when the time, the waiting period is over, you will see the fullness of that manifestation because it will be so easy. That's why he has been taking you on a journey of obedience and a journey of faith. And you will see that manifestation break out so greatly upon your life. Amen. You are the glory of the Lord and I honor each and every one of you because of the blessedness of the one who called you right from the very beginning. I bless you with mercy and I bless you with life in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you. Stay blessed. I love you. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah.